Um, all right. Well, I apologize for being a little bit late, guys. There was uh, some technical difficulties uh, with me. My webcam is not working. So uh, I just get to hear my voice here. Um, so do we have, is everybody on? Are we good to go here? Or yeah, you is, are. Uh, you're good to go. And just appreciate you having, having you on. So I'm going to mute myself and take my camera off and let you go here. Okay. Okay. All right. So um, my name is Ben Anthony. So I'm a, a, a laryngologist at the uh, Indiana University. Um, and I appreciate the opportunity to, to discuss with you guys a little bit about management of unilateral vocal paralysis. Uh, ben Rubenstein is another laryngologist who's going to be giving a, a complimentary lecture after here. So we're trying to coordinate the two. There might be some overlap between the two lectures. So uh, bear with us, uh, y'all. Um, so uh, we're going to talk a little bit about the presentation of vocal fold paralysis, uh, kind of my thoughts on intervention strategies, um, and then some of the different uh, treatment uh, options, which include injection laryngoplasty, uh, medialization thyroplasty, and uh, laryngeal re -innervation. So uh, this is an example of a patient with a unilateral vocal fold paralysis and kind of what their voice sounds like. So when I hear a patient who presents with a voice like that, um, <clears throat> you know, for, for me kind of seeing a lot of this type of stuff, uh, that strikes me as a very clear example of a unilateral vocal fold paralysis um, or some sort of what we call a, like a leaky valve. So what I hear in him is a breathy voice. The pitch is kind of altered. It's almost a higher pitch than you would expect from a, uh, the, the typical male range because of the way the vocal folds are, are, are vibrating and, and tensing to try to bring them together. And uh, there's a lot of air wasting as uh, the patient talks, uh, which actually causes him to cough at one point. Um, and so this is a pretty typical uh, exam of somebody who uh, uh, I'm suspicious of having a vocal fold paralysis issue. And um, <clears throat> so, you know, patients, uh, can present at lots of different stages though. So people can come in with almost no voice at all. So almost a complete breathy uh, dysphonia or aphonia to just merely complaining that they get vocally tired or they're experiencing vocal fatigue. Uh, and uh, again, we, we have this phenomenon where we almost call it a paralytic falsetto, which we're, in which the pitch can increase by almost 85 Hertz in some patients. Um, sometimes you have this like gurgling sound, which can come from pooled secretions in the piriform. This is particularly notable in high vagal injuries. And uh, sometimes the patient presents with more of a strained sound to their voice due to compensatory superglottic hyperfunction. Um, so there's a huge variation as to why people uh, or how people present with unilateral vocal fold paralysis. And most of the reason, uh, uh, and then of course, dysphagia and aspiration. So you always want to assess uh, or ask the patient if they're having trouble swallowing, if they're feeling like they're coughing after they're uh, drinking liquids, and uh, in particular, if they've had any pneumonias uh, recently, because uh, obviously that kind of heightens your resolve to want to proceed with some sort of intervention for these patients. So, uh, what are the etiologies of these? Um, so, you know, the, the vast majority of them, or not the vast majority, but the most common cause is malignancy uh, or related to malignancy. Um, we cause a lot of them iatrogenically with surgical trauma. Uh, a fair amount are idiopathic and we never really find the, uh, the cause. And then you can see the uh, uh, other uh, causes here. Um, so, uh, <clears throat> intervention strategies. So, um, uh, you know, we have multiple things that we can do for when you have somebody that has a new vocal fold paralysis uh, that you're diagnosing. So we can proceed with watchful waiting in this patient. We can uh, try voice therapy with them. 
Uh, we can inject materials into the vocal fold to medialize them. We can do laryngeal framework surgery. And then there's some people out there that are doing laryngeal re procedures for these patients. Um, so uh, when we talk about these strategies, it's very interesting that if you look at the history of treatment of, vo of uh, vocal fold paralysis, we actually started by with the laryngeal re And uh, with a lot of things in medicine, things have kind of become, uh, kind of pop up in a cyclical fashion throughout the history of medicine. So Charles Frazier described doing a laryngeal re on a patient uh, back in the 20s. Um, but then the, the technique of laryngeal re really kind of fell out of favor because we started developing uh, new materials to inject into the larynx and this procedure seemed to be safer and easier to perform and so really kind of gained popularity uh, in comparison to uh, laryngeal re -ervation. And then the framework surgery was first developed by Ashiki and uh, really kind of gained popularity here in the United States. And it's probably the uh, most popular uh, surgery for uh, fixing, uh, um, permanent fixing of a, of, a, of a vocal fold paralysis. But then, you know, not, uh, uh, like, like a lot of things in medicine, we're starting to see kind of this re surgeons of people talking about laryngeal re and its role in potentially providing an even superior vocal result than amelization thyroplasty. So, <clears throat> so how do I deal with this at, uh, at uh, Indiana University? So I think that it's, uh, like I was mentioning before, you know, I think one of the most important things is to assess the risk of aspiration in, these, in, uh, in the patient population. So if aspiration is present, or if they're at a high risk of aspiration, then I really push the patient to do something uh, early on. Um, and that something can either be an injection laryngoplasty or uh, one of these other more permanent procedures, but typically I, I recommend a early uh, injection laryngoplasty. If they are not having any aspiration, and the patient uh, doesn't really want to proceed with any sort of intervention, then it is perfectly acceptable to just watch them. We don't have to intervene just for the voice unless the patient's bothered by it. So especially, you know, like a post-thyroid surgery where, you know, the, the surgeon feels like the, the nerve was intact, um, you know, that's perfectly acceptable just to watch and wait if the patient's not particularly bothered by their voice as long as there's no risk of aspiration. So if they do want to do something, um, if it's within six months of the causal event, then uh, you know, our options here are to temporize with an injection laryngoplasty. Um, and I use mostly uh, uh, two materials. So I use Pro or Renew Voice Gel, or the other brand is Prolarin Voice Gel. And both of these I find last about a month uh, before they start to wear off. Um, the nice thing about both voice, the voice gels, um, number one, they're FDA approved for use in the larynx, which uh, for some of us is an, is an important consideration depending on institutional uh, uh, kind of uh, oversight. Uh, and number two, they're extremely safe. So regardless of where you place this material or uh, if it winds up getting into Renke's space or, um, or, or other places where you don't want it to, to go to, the chances of it doing something permanently detrimental to, the, to a person's vocal fold is extremely, extremely low. Um, so especially when I'm working with residents who may, might not have done a lot of injection procedures, I find this material to be very forgiving. And so uh, I, I like to use it a lot. Uh, the other one that I use um, with a, 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 a fair amount of frequency is a, a hyaluronic acid material. So I, I uh, use Juvederm. Another brand out there is Restylane. Um, these materials last about six months. Um, that's typically what I like to quote patients. You know, when you look at Juvederm, uh, when they're using it like in the lips or on the face, uh, the company quotes that it lasts one to two years. We think that it degrades a little quicker in the vocal folds because of the vibration kind of uh, uh, perhaps breaks up the product a little bit faster. Um, but it, from, uh, from clinical observations, I would say that it's unlikely to give us one to two years of, of, uh, of duration in the vocal fold.
This is a non FDA approved use of the medication. Um, it will never be FDA approved. The companies will just never uh, will never seek approval for uh, injection into the larynx because they make so much money using it cosmetically. So you do have to tell patients that it's an off-label use of the, of the material, um, but I do think it's a very good material. One downside to hyaluronic acid is that there are reports of an, an inflammatory reaction that can occur in a very small portion of patients. Um, and so especially if you're considering a bilateral injection, depending on how much abduction or uh, uh, opening of the glottis you have, um, you just have to consider the fact that if they are in that like less than 1%, um, we think it's maybe around 0.8% of patients who get an inflammatory reaction from the material, will, will, they, will they be okay? Um, the third material that's used uh, with uh, frequency is uh, called Prolarin Plus or Renew with uh, CAHA. CAHA stands for calcium hydroxyapatite. This material does last several years uh, in the larynx and it is FDA approved. Um, I do not like using uh, this material at all. Uh, I find it to be very unforgiving. So if it goes into a spot where you do not want it to go, it can permanently stiffen that area of the vocal fold. Uh, and so it makes me very nervous using it in an awake patient um, or with, a, uh, with residents. So um, if I'm within six months of the suspected causal injury, then I'll, I'll try to push patients to do one of these injection procedures like I described above. If I'm outside of the six month window, then I start to consider laryngeal framework surgery with patients. Uh, or other, uh, or sometimes uh, laryngeal re depending on the, the, uh, in, uh, the patient age and other indications. We'll talk about that more in a second here. This six month time period is uh, somewhat controversial um, in the laryngology world. Uh, you know, what we're trying to do is wait for the thyroarytenoid muscle to have time to atrophy slightly. Um, because if you do an early implant, the thought is, is if the muscle continues to atrophy, then you might have an undersized implant. And then the patient might not have as good of a vocal result uh, uh, in the coming, uh, in the future. Um, I've found that most patients want to just get on with their lives. And so coming, coming up with some sort of uh, time frame that's acceptable between the patient and the, and the surgeon, I think is, is important. So it, for me, it's usually around the six month mark that I say, okay, maybe it's time to consider something permanent here. There are reports of returned mobility of the vocal fold um, up to a year after um, uh, injury. But usually if you don't see any movement at the six month mark, the chances of you having meaningful voluntary move or movement back to the vocal fold is very, very, very small. And so I feel comfortable proceeding with the laryngeal framework surgery uh, at, the, at about the six month mark. There are some people that say, nope, I wait a whole year. Um, and that's acceptable as well. It's a little bit uh, kind of one of those art of medicine type things. So uh, what about the role of laryngeal EMG? So um, I think that uh, laryngeal EMG or electromyography provides useful data, um, but in my opinion, it does not really change anything in terms of the timing of what I would do with a patient or uh, the choice of treatment options. So, um, you know, almost everybody waits at least three months from injury. Um, again, in my, in my personal practice, I wait about six months because uh, this allows for muscle atrophy. So, and um, regardless of what the EMG shows, I'm going to still do the same thing. Sometimes an EMG is helpful in just like letting patients kind of come to terms with what's happened. Like, look, you have no EMG signal. You are, it is paralyzed. We do not think there's any chance of, of re here. And sometimes that allows patients to kind of move on with the process. Um, there's not a lot of great literature to uh, studying what, how the difference of outcomes is if we do an early uh, uh, permanent intervention like a thyroplasty. Uh, Paul Kwok uh, did a nice paper. Um, he's a laryngologist in New, in New York uh, where he looked at early thyroplasty that was done within three months of, inter, uh, of, uh, uh, of injury 
And um, he found that the recurrence uh, or the need for revision surgery um, does go up uh, precipitously to about to around 20 to 30 percent um, when uh, when when it's done early. However, sometimes I'll tell patients that you know, but that still means that over two thirds of patients are happy with the result and never have anything done. Um, and and uh, so it is something to consider. I will uh, generally reserve early thyroplasty for cardiothoracic patients who um, might have had something done to their aortic arch. And uh, with those patients, usually they're undergoing this really big surgery. Um, sometimes they're coming in from out of town or from far away. And uh, we just try to quote unquote fix them as best we can before they leave the hospital. And so those will be the ones that I tend to do an early thyroplasty on. Um, the, uh, the other thing is the cardiothoracic surgeons usually want them to have really good pulmonary toilet, toilet and, and coughing. And so sometimes the thyroplasty just gives them a little bit more to kind of cough against than some of this gel material. And so uh, that's, that's, that's the instant in which I'll do an early thyroplasty. All right, sorry, I'm just trying to look at the time here. Oh, it looks like we're doing okay. Um, okay, so injection laryngoplasty. So, um, when we talk about the injection laryngoplasty with these different gels, uh, there's uh, <clears throat> um, you know uh, kind of a sh been a paradigm shift into doing a lot of these in the office or in some sort of kind of non-operating room environment uh, versus traditionally more have been done in the operating room. Uh, I would in my practice, I do about ninety five percent of them, maybe more than that in my office. Uh, and uh, I, I generally just uh, reserve the ones in the operating room for people who can't tolerate an in-office injection. Um, we have, uh, I think most people are familiar with how to do this in the operating room. So I'll talk briefly about in-office injections or awake injections. Um, basically, there's three common approaches. Uh, we have the transoral approach, which is uh, using a long curved needle uh, to go through uh, uh, through the mouth. Um, there's the transthyrohyoid membrane approach, which is coming in from above the vocal fold while there's a scope in the nose to watch the needle coming in. There's a transcricothyroid membrane approach, so done almost like a Botox injection. Um, and uh, there should be added on here. Uh, it's just not something that I do a lot of, but I know it's done uh, at other centers a lot is uh, an injection through a channeled laryngoscope. So this is a picture from one of the laryngology textbooks of a patient's neck kind of marking out the different uh, spots here. So if we see the thyroid notch, uh, which is outlined very nicely right here, if you're doing a trans or uh, uh, thyrohyoid approach, then um, you're, you would uh, uh, place the needle uh, right at the, above the thyroid notch here aiming it down towards the vocal folds. Uh, the cricothyroid membrane, which I think is outlined here with this um, uh, bigger square, that would be where you would um, pr uh, aim the needle to go uh, do a cricothyroid membrane approach. So the needle would go up and into the vocal fold this way. Um, and um, yeah, if only every patient was that skinny and had that good of uh, landmarks on their neck. Um, so we talked about this uh, before. So these are different uh, materials that people use. Um, there, there are lots of other uh, materials that people um, sometimes use, more sliced gel foam. Uh, fat is a great option that some people use out there. Um, there's a, a injectable cadaveric tissue called Symmetra that is sometimes used. Um, but again, the only two that are FDA approved are these two up here, which is the carboxymethyl cellulose um, or prolarin voice gel or renew voice gel. And this other one, uh, calcium hydroxyapatite, um, which is prolarin plus or renew plus. So this is a picture of a injection laryngoplasty using a trans uh, thyrohyoid approach. So you can see the needle coming in above the thyroid notch right here. You can see there's an assistant holding a scope in the nose and it's being projected on the screen right here. And, uh, and that's how the setup uh, generally goes. This is an ex uh, example of me doing an injection. 
on a patient with a left vocal fold paralysis. So what you can note here is kind of the bowing appearance of the vocal fold right here, the medialized and displaced uh, arytenoid from the loss of tone uh, from the abductor, from the posterior cricoarytenoid muscle. Um, and then this is a transthyrohyoid injection, what it looks like here. So when I uh, do this in the office, I spray a little bit of tetracaine and uh, afrin in the nose. And then I have the patient inhale 4% uh, lidocaine nebulized treatment. I use five mLs of that. Uh, usually that's enough to get the patient numb enough. If they're not numb enough, then I'll inject a little bit of lidocaine directly onto the vocal folds in addition to that. Um, and then uh, I'll numb up the thyroid uh, membrane area with a little bit of 1% lidocaine with uh, 1 to 100,000 epinephrine. So you can see the needle coming in at the petiole the epiglottis and going into the thyroid muscle on the left side there. And you can see as it's injecting, you're seeing increased fullness of the uh, left vocal fold, as well as uh, um, kind of filling in of that concavity of, uh, of the vocal fold. So you can see how you have kind of a, a nice medialization there. Now this was an older gentleman, so I put a little bit on the other side as well, because uh, sometimes these older patients have a little bit of uh, atrophy associated with their injury as well, or with their long-term problem. So once they're numb, I mean, you can tell that he's, this guy's you know, tolerating this very well. He's not making any noises. And then we chest to make sure they have good vocal fold closure uh, that we've medialized them enough, and that softens up at the softens up as the uh, material kind of disperses throughout the um, paraglottic space and throughout the muscle. Uh, and um, this gentleman had a very nice result from uh, from this procedure. So it's tolerated very well. Um, there's only a small percentage of patients that I can't get numb enough or comfortable enough to be able to do that in the office. And then those patients will just schedule to take to the operating room to do the injection uh, procedure in the operating room. Uh, the same materials are used uh, in the operating room. There's no difference with that. Uh, it's just, you know, you're, you're, you're having to put the patient to sleep, which um, uh, is just, a, uh, and you're going through a laryngoscope instead of these awake approaches. Um, so thyroplasty is uh, the, another option uh, for patients, and this is considered a permanent option. Um, and so, as I mentioned before, uh, the first person to really describe the thyroplasty is a shiki um, out in Japan, uh, kind of was one of the uh, modern um, uh, fathers, I guess you can say, of the, of the surgery. Um, and he described four types of thyroplasty procedures. And uh, the one that we're gonna be concerned with with vocal fold immobility is the type one thyroplasty or the lateral compression or medialization. Obviously, this is not how we do it nowadays. We have different materials that we use to medialize the vocal fold uh, and different techniques as well. Um, but these are the other ones that are listed here. So he did describe all four in his original paper uh, to both shorten the vocal folds expand the vocal folds and lengthen the vocal fold. So when we talk about a type one thyroplasty, there are several different systems or materials that can be used. Uh, probably the most um, common historically has been a silastic plastic block um, that, uh, um, that people carve uh, intraoperatively. The um, other uh, material that's being used with more and more frequency is Gore-Tex. Um, uh, that's probably the material I use um, the most. Um, then there are some kits that are, have been developed. One is called the VOCOM kit, um, and then the Montgomery Thyroplasty Implant System. Um, I find that usually most uh, head and neck uh, surgeons will uh, are the ones that are using these two systems and most laryngologists are using these and that I think that's just historical training preference. Um, you can kind of uh, uh, individualize uh, the Gore-Tex and the Silastic a little bit more than you can these kits. 
Um, but again, uh, they, they all work to do kind of the same thing, which is to medialize the vocal fold. So when I trained, um, I was fortunate enough to have uh, two laryngologists who I trained under that did primarily Gore-Tex thyroplasties and two that primarily did Silastic. So um, I was able to get a pretty nice uh, uh, viewpoint from both of them and kind of uh, think about the uh, advantages and disadvantages. And of course, this is all anecdotal, just from my experience here. I, I tried to see if I could write a paper about this, but it was just too challenging in terms of kind of the various techniques that they use and everything. But in my opinion, um, the differences between using a Gore-Tex and then Silastic is that um, when you do a Silastic implant, uh, to talk about this first point here, the window, and I'm gonna show you some pictures of this in a second here, has to be absolutely precise. So the placement of the window for a Silastic implant makes a huge difference uh, in the surgery. Uh, if, it's, if it's off, uh, in terms of the angulation, or if it's too anterior or too posterior, it can really change the results of the surgery pretty significantly. With Gore-Tex, it's much more forgiving. Um, you can manipulate the Gore-Tex in the paraglide space a lot easier, uh, and so you don't have to be as precise with the, with the window. Uh, I find in my hands that I'm faster with the Gore-Tex thyroplasty. I, I can do it about 30 minutes faster than the Silastic implant. Um, most of that is because of time spent carving the implant. Um, uh, but there's some, uh, some of these uh, window issues and kind of measuring them I also find adds to time for Silastic as well. 30 minutes uh, doesn't really seem like a lot of time, but even if it's 15 minutes, um, it, when you're having a wake patient during the surgery, uh, 15 minutes can be a, a huge difference between kind of them staying comfortable or them starting to get kind of agitated during the awake procedure. Uh, downside to Gore-Tex is that I, th I do think that the implant can potentially shift um, uh, with more uh, frequency than Silastic. Again, this is anecdotal, um, but I do feel like the Silastic is more sturdy and is better for larger gaps. When you start to put in a lot of Gore-Tex, the chances of it kind of shifting around in the paraglide space, I think, is a little higher than a good solid Silastic implant. There's some technical considerations with doing an arytenoid adduction in Gore-Tex that makes it a, a little more challenging. Um, there's an alternate technique called an arytenoid pexy that can be done with a Gore-Tex implant, um, but, uh, but you, really that it's much easier to do the arytenoid adduction with a silastic implant than with Gore-Tex. Uh, again, Gore-Tex, you can, uh, another advantage of this is that you can use a wide variety of instruments um, where really you do need some, speciali some specialty instruments um, with the, in order to do a good silastic implant. So this is the operative setup for a lot of people with um, when they're doing a thyroplasty. So it, the patient is actually awake during this procedure. I don't know if there's residents listening in who have never done this procedure yet, but the procedure is done under monitored anesthesia care. And the reason why that is, is that we want to be able to hear the patient's voice quality while we place an implant into the vocal fold. And uh, in addition, we want to be very precise as to where we place the implant. And so uh, you need to be able to visualize the vocal folds during the procedure. So this is one setup that's uh, used where people pl uh, hang uh, a scope um, in order to monitor the vocal folds intraoperatively. Um, and then you have to kind of drape it out so you can use x-ray sheeting or different types of kind of the, the sterile kind of plastic sheeting in order to kind of protect the scope so that it doesn't uh, be contaminated during the procedure. And then you, of course, have your neck prepped out like you normally would. But the patient is awake. You can see they just have a little bit of nasal cannula oxygen on, uh, on during the procedure. Once the procedure begins, we make an incision about three to four centimeters uh, at the midline of the, uh, between the thyroid notch and the inferior portion of the thyroid cartilage. Uh, the subcutaneous tissue is divided and the platysma is divided and I raise subplatysmal flaps um, up to the hyoid bone and down below the cricoid. Um, once uh, you've raised your subplatysmal flaps, then uh, you divide the strap muscles at midline and reflect your strap muscles laterally. Oftentimes, in order to get really good exposure of the entire thyroid ala, you'll have to partially divide the thyrohyoid strap muscle. 
And so uh, it usually inserts um, uh, up about here. They're not really showing it in this step here. So I'll, I'll just partially divide that. I won't take the entire strap muscle, but I'll take enough of it off so that I can expose the uh, portion of the thyroid ala that, um, that I need to be able to, to expose. So then you have to raise a perichondrial flap. Um, if you're doing a Gore-Tex thyroplasty, we usually do an inferiorly based uh, perichondrial flap. Um, for a silastic thyroplasty, most people do a lateral based perichondrial flap. Uh, the, the variations in technique don't matter as much as the fact that you need to get that perichondrium up off of the cartilage. Um, it provides the blood supply to the cartilage um, and also functions as a very good uh, uh, cover uh, when you're finished with your surgery. So again, this would be when doing a Gore-Tex thyroplasty and inferiorly based thyroid uh, uh, perichondrial flap. So then you have to place your window. And um, the most important consideration for placement of the window is kind of this angulation of the thyroplasty window. So like I mentioned previously, when you're using a silastic implant, the uh, uh, placement of the window has to be extremely precise. And um, one kind of uh, common pitfall in the surgery is that you have to take into account the muscular process of the thyroid cartilage, which we see down here. So we really want to find the true inferior border of the thyroid cartilage um, and measure off of, that, uh, off of that line. If you just kind of follow the thyroid cartilage back anteriorly, then you can, it's very easy to, um, to trace back the uh, muscular process of the thyroid cartilage where the cricothyroid muscle is inserting and kind of uh, have an angulation that's askew here. And this will make it so that you can't really get good inferior medialization of the vocal fold and the patient just won't have a good result. And you'll have too much superior medialization of the vocal fold and you get kind of this like harsh kind of wet sound um, when that happens. So where we make these windows, we, we want to go as low as we possibly can and still maintain an inferior strut that's not going to break. So for most people, this is two to three millimeters. And in most females, we go about five millimeters back from midline. And with men, we extend that a little bit back to seven millimeters back from midline is where the anterior portion of the window goes. With a silastic implant, um, the window is quite large. So it's 13 millimeters by six millimeters is how wide this window is. And we have these specialized tools to try to help us make this very, very precise. When I do a Gore-Tex implant, I do a little six by six millimeter window uh, uh, approximately right here. So once you have your window of thyroid cartilage removed, then you have to remove the inner perichondrium. And so you're, you're seeing a little scalpel making an incision in the inner perichondrium here, and then you get rid of that. And then you have to start raising the paraglottic space. So we probe posteriorly with a specialized instrument um, that I call the hockey stick, although you could use like a freer or caudal to do this as well. Um, and sometimes I even will reach underneath the thyroid cartilage itself and kind of really push in the entire pergolotic space here. Um, you just have to be very cognizant of the ventricle because um, this is where the uh, tissue is the thinnest right here. So you just don't want to probe something into the ventricle area because that can potentially lacerate the mucosa um, and then you're done for the day. So once you have the paraglottic space raised, then uh, there's another specialized tool that allows us to size the implant that we want. Um, and so uh, um, we kind of figure out what size we want to be, how high does it need to be, and, and in which areas. And then that allows one to then carve an implant if they're doing silastic. I um, mean, these are kind of the steps here. You kind of make like a mountain and then uh, slope it down. I think uh, Dr. Rubenstein is going to talk about this more. But when you do a, a, a Gore-Tex implant, um, we just take the Gore-Tex and we start layering it in and you kind of move it around until you find uh, the spots where you're improving the voice the most and then you keep kind of layering it in there. And this is kind of a schematic diagram. It rarely looks that uh, um, precise, but uh, this is kind of what it looks like when you're all uh, said and done here. 
um, and it's medializing this vocal fold by pushing the paraglottic space over and pushing that vocal fold in. So what are some common complications from this procedure? So uh, there's been a report of about 13.8% uh, of airway compromise. Um, I haven't found this to be uh, in, in my experience, um, but, uh, uh, but this is what you know. Like some some good literature has suggested. Um, they do say that this is often very mild, so I'm not sure exactly what they're meaning um, from this. We do put patients on steroids, uh, whether or not they go home after the procedure. They all go. Uh, they all are placed on postoperative steroids to try to help with any sort of swelling in the area and uh, and airway issues. Um, papers have reported a rate of up to 0.6% of thyroplasties uh, will wind up get, getting intubated postoperatively and 2.2% of thyroplasties with retinoid induction. Um, my experience has been zero, but then again, they, the old saying is if you haven't had the complication yet, you just haven't done it enough. So, um, extrusion of implant. So, um, you know, either medially into the airway or laterally into the neck occurs about 0.8% of the time. Um, when it lateralizes, medializes into the airway, this is most likely due to a failure to recognize that you had a ventric, uh, ventricular mucosal perforation. Um, a superiorly based implant is the most common uh, pitfall that I see that requires me to do a revision uh, thyroplasty on somebody. Um, where the window is just placed too high and people are medializing the superior part of the vocal fold and you just don't ever get a really good voice result from that. Anteriorly based implants will lead to a pressed sounding voice um, and uh, are uh, um, a, a common indication for a revision thyroplasty as well. Failure to close the posterior glottic gap is something that we all struggle with um, and uh, the, um, I wouldn't necessarily cause this, call this a complication, but more limitation of the procedure. Um, this is where sometimes the other techniques such as a retinoid adduction or a retinoid pexy can come into play. And Dr. Rubenstein is gonna talk about those more. So this would be an example of somebody probing that paraglottic space and perforating the ventricular mucosa. So if that were to happen, um, you know, the, 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 it would not be safe to place an implant at that time. Uh, you know, this is another reason why we're monitoring the, the larynx intraluminally with the scope in the nose. Um, and you would see blood in that area. That would be the main kind of indication that uh, there was something wrong. You could also sometimes have the patient Valsalva, depending on where the injury is. And you might see some bubbles coming up through your, uh, through your wound. If I was suspicious of a mucosal injury, then I would stop the procedure and close up and then have to come back uh, at, an, at another date to place the implant. Uh, this is an example of a superiorly based implant. Um, the implant is here on the right side, and you can see this person basically just medialized the uh, superglottis and not the actual vocal fold. This is an anteriorly based implant. I'm sorry, this is a really bad image, but you can see this swelling right here. So this implant is way too anterior, and it needs to be kind of more broad-based and, and posterior back here. And so this person had a very pressed voice with a large gap posteriorly, so that was an implant that needed to be revised. So one thing that we consider is, is uh, previous neck irradiation okay for somebody who uh, you know, has undergone radiation therapy. There was a nice uh, series done by Dale Ekbaum at Mayo, uh, and um, he found that there was no increased complications or risks of doing this in a person with a uh, previously irradiated neck. So here's an example of how it sounds. Um, this is the same patient. And this is uh, that same patient after a type one thyroplasty. So the, the results can be pretty dramatic and um, it makes a surgery actually a lot of fun. Um, it's one of the very few things that we do in surgery where you have this immediate uh, instant gratification 
because the patient basically leaves the operating room with a with a very good sounding voice. Um, and so for that reason, this is uh, by far my favorite surgery to do. Um, uh, and uh, but um, that's the expectation. So I always tell patients that you know sometimes patients will ask like, well, what about my singing voice? Um, singing voice rarely is as good as preoperative, uh, like or pre-injury, um, for various reasons. But the sp and the speaking voice is, you know, when we when we really do perceptual analysis, it's never as good as the pre-injury voice. However, it's usually good enough that that a stranger or somebody who doesn't know the sound of somebody's voice would never be able to tell that they had a vocal fold paralysis. And so that's the goal that we, that we, um, that we have with these patients. Okay, so uh, laryngeal re -innervation. So um, there are some limitations of, uh, and I'm, I'm gonna go through this a little bit quickly here so you guys have some time to answer question or ask some questions. Um, but there are some limitations of static medialization. So uh, one is, is that the, uh, um, maximum effectiveness is anterior on the vocal fold, um, which makes this less effective in aspiration or large posterior glottic gaps. Um, the, uh, 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 static medialization can produce, a, um, can become less effective in time with continued atrophy of the thyroid arytenoid muscle. And so, um, you know, when we think about laryngeal re innervation, we have this ultimate goal of being able to restore complete neurologic function to functional muscles. Um, but we know that that's not possible. Um, uh, and, uh, and, I'll t and then we'll explain why, uh, or b because uh, of the way re innervation procedures uh, work here. So what we do know is that when we have looked at people who have sectioned the recurrent laryngeal nerve in the past, uh, for different reasons, there's this uh, the, um, reinnervation process that occurs uh, in the larynx, and a lot of this happens from bridging neuronal uh, uh, um, uh, uh, kind of branching points that uh, that we know from anatomic studies happen. So here is the nerve of Galen um, that is uh, between the superior laryngeal nerve, which is the SLN right here, and the recurrent laryngeal nerve. Uh, in this study right here. And so you can see these, these two nerve bran uh, branching trees actually connect. We call it the nerve of Galen. Um, we also know that if you were to do pretty EMG into the thyroid muscle of some people with uh, vocal fold paralysis and ask them to sniff, you can actually see uh, um, muscle activity. So we know that there is some sort of synkinetic re that's happening in the muscle uh, fiber. So um, what we think happens when we do a laryngeal re is we have these, uh, this nerve that's being re but within the recurrent laryngeal nerve, there are sensory fibers, parasympathetic fibers, sympathetic fibers, as well as our various motor nerves that go to both the abductor and adductor muscles of the larynx. And when we re that, uh, it's we we can't don't really get selective innervation to the adductors go, fibers going to the adductor fibers or the abductors going to the abductors. It's kind of this mishmash, and so you get this competing reinnervation or synkinesis between the abductors and the adductors of the larynx. But what when that does happen, what we've found is that it kind of brings this tone to the thyroid uh, complex and the, and the vocal fold itself, that it allows us a good re restoration of height and rotation of the arytenoid when, uh, when you have good uh, syn uh, kinetic re of the recur uh, recurrent laryngeal nerve. So this allows more complete closure of the posterior glottic gap and kind of a more symmetric stiffness to the muscle as well. And, and obviously this continued tone provides improved bulk to the thyroid uh, muscle. And so for that reason, we don't really think that the goal is to restore uh, function there, but it's more um, to restore proper position of the arytenoid tone and stiffness. Um, and so there's kind of separate goals then also for bilateral vocal paralysis, which we're not really talking about today. Um, but 
there is a use for this procedure in unilateral uh, vocal fold paralysis. So um, this was first kind of described by uh, 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 Harvey Tucker uh, um, and in the 70s and early 80s, he was doing uh, a um, neuromuscular pedicle graft. So he was taking uh, the ansa cervicalis going into one of the strap muscles and taking a cuff of the muscle and then plugging it into the posterior cricorytmoid muscle or the adductor compartment of the uh, of the um, thyroritinoid kind of muscle paraglotic space here. And uh, he was reporting good success with that, with this procedure. Um, on a national scale, people weren't really kind of having the same success that he was having. So this procedure has largely fallen out of favor, but the idea kind of stuck. Um, and um, it's grown to uh, 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 Roger Crumley out in California kind of continued this work and this idea of can we continue to refine this laryngeal reinnervation procedure? And he wrote a really nice uh, uh, trilogic thesis where he talked about voice quality following laryngeal reinnervation using the ANSA hypoglossy nerve. Um, and um, this is the preferred method of doing a laryngeal reinnervation uh, to today. So how it's done is, is very accessible for every head and neck surgeon. Um, we find the recurrent laryngeal nerve in the tracheoesophageal groove, uh, and then we find a branch of the ansa hypoglossy. Um, we really want a terminal branch, so something uh, kind of one of the branches going to the omohyoid is, is usually the preferred branch. And then we do a neurography and sew those two uh, nerves together. When we compare kind of this nerve uh, suturing technique, which is uh, said by an S here versus this neuromuscular pedicle technique, we find that the amplitude of EMG is much greater with this nerve suture technique than the neuromuscular pedicle technique. And so we think that this is a better way of doing this than Harvey Tucker's original description of the neuromuscular uh, pedicle implant. Um, there is a very several studies that have been done in the past 10 years kind of looking at this. Kind of the largest study was out of China uh, in which they had 237 cases where they did a ansa hypoglossy to recurrent laryngeal nerve reinnervation following thyroid surgery. And um, they showed that uh, there are um, changes in uh, different various uh, scores for vocal quality uh, were uh, significantly improved. I'm always a little bit suspicious when people say show perfect results like, like uh, we see here, um, but uh, in any case, they showed uh, statistically significant improvement in the vocal folds. And this is, a, the, this is from their paper. So this is a patient of theirs that has a left vocal fold paralysis preoperatively. So you can see there's a very large gap, very breathy voice. Um, and then this is uh, the, the same patient postoperatively after ANSA recurrent laryngeal nerve anastomosis. So that's pretty, pretty dang good vocal fold closure, nice bulk of this thyroid muscle. Um, this would be, uh, in my mind, a very good result. Um, this procedure, because of the neuroplasticity in children and, and younger adults, um, it tends to work better on people the younger they are. And so this has really gained a lot of uh, uh, um, popularity in the pediatric otolaryngology community. Uh, out in um, uh, Utah, they have a, a, a nice kind of uh, running trial of this, and this is an early cohort of patients uh, that underwent this procedure that shows a uh, significant improvement of the uh, Grabow scale um, in, in, from nine patients undergoing this procedure. And then at one point in time, uh, uh, Randy Piniello at Washington University tried to do a head-to-head -head comparison between medialization laryngoplasty and laryngeal reinnervation, which is uh, notated by the ML and the R LR here. And um, the study actually had to be concluded early for various uh, reasons um, uh, uh, to do with the study, um, but it showed a trend towards 
but patients who are under 52 years of age had a nicer result with uh, laryngeal reinnervation, and over 52 years of age had a, had a worse result with laryngeal reinnervation. So this was kind of the study that most of us uh, kind of quote uh, or think about in our minds when we consider the age of a patient uh, in considering this procedure. I do think that there is a lot of uh, interesting things that can be done with laryngeal reinnervation and, uh, and and kind of the future of this. Uh, I went out and uh, and observed uh, Jean Paul Marie uh, out in Rouen, France. Uh, it's a suburb of Paris, um, and uh, he uh, almost exclusively does laryngeal reinnervation for uh, unilateral vocal paralysis, um, and his results are are quite good. Um, certainly much better than what I'm, I've been getting here uh, in Indiana. Um, and so I went out there to observe what he's doing and he has some very fancy techniques that he uses um, uh, and different materials that he places around the neurora feed to try to stimulate uh, the new neuronal connections. And he also does this procedure for bilateral vocal paralysis. So I think in the future, we're gonna see um, a kind of a resurgence of people interested in this procedure again. Um, but for now, it's more of kind of a, a small uh, percentage of patients that I do this in my adult uh, unilateral vocal fold patient population. So, um, oh, this is for something else. Sorry, guys. Um, that is uh, uh, pretty much it for my lecture. Uh, Dr. Rubenstein is going to add a lot to what I just said, um, but I'm. Uh, uh, certainly willing and able to take some uh, questions if anybody has any questions. Anybody there? That was a really great talk, Ben. Thanks a lot. That actually um, complements my lecture nicely. It looks like you do have a question. How many medializations do you do in a year from Suresh? Um, I think I do about, uh, last year I might have done 30 or 35 medializations. So I'm doing about one or two a month. Um, yeah. For a while, I was the only laryngologist here at Indiana University. It's a pretty big medical center. And so um, I was getting kind of everything that was coming in the door, so. Any other questions, guys? Thank you, Dr. Anthony. I think 